welcome, bienvenidos a todos. Gracias por acompañarnos. Thank you for being here this evening. My name is Alfredo Reyes, and I am the director of programs and operations here at the Latino Cultural Arts Center. Uh, before we get started, I want to acknowledge that the land on which Colorado was settled is the traditional and unceded territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Comanche nations. We at the LCAC pay our respect to the indigenous people's past, present, and future, and to those that have stewarded this land generation after generation. However, before moving forward, I want to have a moment of silence in honor of all those that have lost their lives in the wake of COVID-19, directly and indirectly, which the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has recently estimated the excess deaths to be over 300,000 people. Uh, my heart goes out to them and their families as I too lost my father on April 4th of 2020. And it's in his honor and his memory that Ofrendas 2020 was born. So before we get started, I wanna tell you all about Ofrendas 2020. Uh, Ofrendas is a multifaceted presentation of the ancient and contemporary traditions that make up Dia de los Muertos. It is an invitation to co-create with local and international artisans while honoring all of those that have come before us and whose struggle set the foundation for our success. Ofrendas tells the stories of loss, but also of resilience and creativity, of coming together as a community to learn, to heal, and to celebrate. Ofrendas traces the ancient roots of Dia de los Muertos to the Aztec calendars. It gives us insights into processing historical traumas that become embedded into our DNA while highlighting the importance of food and healing in and community building. And finally, it shares the local stories of those that brought Dia de los Muertos to Denver. At the heart of Ofrendas is a unique handmade altar kit that includes the crafts of lo local and international artists. Uh, and it's extremely important for us here at the Latino Cultural Arts Center in that we wanna preserve the handmade and the artisan elements of Dia de los Muertos. We wanna be able to preserve these traditions and avoid Dia de los Muertos becoming this glorified, mass-produced, ethnic version of Halloween, which is why today's presentation is extremely important in that it takes us back to those ancient roots of Dia de los Muertos and gives us an opportunity to really contextualize the importance of the altar tradition in paying our respect to our loved ones that have passed on to the spirit world. Uh, and for more information, please visit our website at www.lcac-denver forward slash ofrendas for more information. Uh, I also wanna th thank our various community partners that have supported Ofrendas 2020 and made it a beautiful collective citywide uh, celebration. And they include D3 Arts, Chalk, Journey Through Our Heritage, Journey Colorado, the Chicano Chicana Studies Department at MSU, Latin Fashion Week Colorado, and finally, Revision. So now, without further ado, it is my honor to introduce you all to Wewe Tlacatl Atikpaxin Young, he is an Apache, Pueblo, elder, traditional healer, consultant, historian, author, artist, and musician. He has worked in radio, television, and theater. Atikpaxin has provided program design, evaluation, and training locally and nationally for 30 years. He has worked as a health educator, prevention specialist, psychotherapist and traditional healer serving diverse populations. He is the founder of Calme Catlan, a traditional indigenous school and has taught courses at universities and high schools. He has just published a book on curanderismo 
called A Magic Feather, which I encourage you all to look into. And we are very, very fortunate to have him with us this evening, as he is one of the few uh, Nahuatl speakers and scholars uh, across the country, and especially here in the region. Uh, and we're very, very lucky to have him join us and sharing his wisdom with us around the ancient traditions of Dia de los Muertos and the altered traditions. Um, before we get started, uh, I want to, one last time, remind you all to turn off your video and your audio uh, before we move forward. Uh, and with that, please join me in giving Wewe Tlacatl at the Paxin Young a warm welcome as he joins us here at the Latino Cultural Arts Center. Piali. Thank you, David. Piali, Nimes Tlapalos. Nano toca a Tecpatzin, Tlawel Niopactok, Nistok, Nikai, Moaya Panditonati. It's a pleasure to be with you here tonight and to be able to do this. And I'm uh, uh, grateful to all the people that have worked to make this, not just tonight's event happen, but all the events that are coming up over the course of the next uh, few, uh, few days and few weeks. So I, I encourage you to follow them and follow up with that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and get started. I do uh, a lot of talking, so let's see if we can all keep up with uh, all that I do. Okay, I stumbles. Um, so say we. Uh, say iwit, iwit is a word that I'm going I'm to use a lot of Nahuatl in here because um, this is uh, where we're going back to in terms of where we're pulling and calling from uh, for Dia de los Muertos. Um, Ilwit is a way of saying um, holiday or festive day or, or it's a special day. Tonati is day, but Ilwit is, is a special day that we celebrate in some way. Um, eh, so, so when you hear with the Nawa speakers, when they say Ilwit, they're either referring to your birthday or they're referring to um, this particular day that we're talking about, which is Dia de los Muertos. Um, and, but they'll also say it as uh, Mika Ilwit. Mika Ilwit mi, from, I'm um, sorry, mi, yeah, yeah, Mika, mi, Mikitzli is the word for death. And so that's what um, they're referring to here as they do it. Um, I'm going to use a lot of the poems. Um, I just have them in English. I don't have them in Nahuatl, but I'm going to call from the uh, corpus of um, residual poetry, poems, uh, the stuff that's left over that fortunately some of the people had the foresight 500 years ago to speak to the elders and document uh, some of their teachings and some of their work. And, and, and it's in the last hundred years or so, this has been a focus of study. So we're able to go back to these documents and actually read them for ourselves because they're, they're here. Uh, we have them. They're written in Nahuatl and then they're sometimes translated in Spanish. They're sometimes not or they're poorly, poorly translated into Spanish, into Castellano. Um, but these are some of them. The time of life is borrowed. In an instant, it must be left behind. There was always this, this question for the philosophers uh, of, of the, uh, I'll say Aztec, it was actually the Triple Alliance, but of the, of the four thinkers, of, of, the, of the priests, of the people of the schools, of the Calmecas, um, they, they had this question, well, so what is life? It's the same question that everyone asks around the world. What is life? Why are we here? What happens after we die? And what is our relationship to those that have been here and that have died? So this isn't, a, that we're not the only ones to ask this question, but, but there are perhaps some things unique to the Aztec um, that we pull from even today. But one of them was what it, sort of their relationship to, to the spirit world, if you will. Here up in the north uh, with the indigenous peoples in this area, they talk a lot about the spirit world. And that's neither heaven nor hell or anything. We, the spirit world is, resides here next to us, by us. So when our, our ancestors go into the spirit world, we, we have a sense that they're still here with us, that we're still connected to them. And we can talk to them, we can leave prayers for them, we can leave food or flowers for them. These are things that we do um, daily and, and different people celebrate those in different ways. But it's about this relationship to something that has nothing to do with how we behaved on earth or how we, how we or somehow or the other have garnered some permission to be in a special place after we die. That's foreign to us. Um, 
Oops, let's see. Uh, my screen doesn't seem to want to move forward. Here we go. Okay, there we got it. So, so I'm going to talk to you. In order to talk to you about this, I'm going to go into uh, a, a whole different uh, idea of this, and that is the idea of calendars. So, what is Dia de los Muertos, and what are we celebrating, and what are we pulling from? And I want to go back to a very, very old bone. This isn't from the Americas. This is called the Ishago bone. It's 20,000 years old. It's a calendar. But when you ask this question about this calendar, you have to ask, why was there an initiative or, or, or a need to count days? And who needed to count those days? And here's something that people don't talk about. It wasn't men. It's women that needed to count the days. Women need to ha needed to have a, a sense of, okay, what, what is my menstrual cycle? How long does it take? How many days are there? And when do I need to be uh, uh, cognizant of it? And so it's the women that started counting days, not the men. And this is really important to understand because uh, we're always giving credit to the men for everything. And we think the men have done all this work, but actually it was women. Women are the ones that started the calendars. So when we look at the Tonal Powali, that's what it's called, um, the calendar of the Mesoamerican calendar, it is really a calendar of the woman's menstrual cycle. No one says this, the men won't say this, but it is a calendar of the woman's menstrual cycle. It is um, tonal powali. Powali is po, powal is to count. So tonal means day. So tonal powan, powali means count of days. That's how that translates. Okay. The count of days, the way it's set up, if you look at it, this is a picture from the first trecena. We call them trecena is a new word. This is and it's actually a Spanish word. No, we don't know what it was called, but people call these trecenas. It's the first 13 days of the calendar. And the calendar is set up in 13-day cycles. The first 13 days will tell the woman when um, she's ovulating. The next 13 days tells her when she's menstruating, right? So it's 26 days. Now, uh, someone might argue, well, actually a woman's cycle is 28 days. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, somewhere between 26, and it, it varies. It's, there's, there's, there, it's, not, it's not the same for everyone. But what this calendar does is it uses particular, uh, uh, it, it pulls from our cosmology, and within our cosmology, there are particular numbers that have significance, and one of those numbers is 13. And so 13 and 20 are two numbers that are used over and over and over again in this calendar and in other ways in terms of, of collecting things and putting them together in ways that we would understand. So this is the first trecena. Now the trecena, within this trecena, there are 20 days. There are names for 20 days. And then we group them into numbers. And we group them into numbers as a way of counting collectively whatever it is we're trying to count. This, so if you do 13 times 20, you get 260 days. What's 260 days? 260 days is about nine months or the gestation period, the time you're in your mother's womb. So this calendar really has nothing to do with the sun. It has nothing to do with the stars. It has nothing to do with the earth's rotation. It has to do with the woman's menstrual cycle and with the gestational period, okay? This is important to understand because we, we often take away power from women and we take away things that really need to be, that they need to be credited for. So I really want to do that here. So in the first trecena, it starts out on the bottom with um, sesipakli, uh, one sipakli. So there's a way that you count these and there are two things associated with each day. One is the name of the day that's associated with the, that's, that it's given. And the second is the number that's given to it. So across the bottom, if you start on the bottom right-hand corner, that's sipakli or crocodile. And then the next one is ehekat. I'll go through them. It's sipakli, ehekat, kali, kotspali, uh, koat, mikitsli, masat, and all the way through. But what you do is you assign a number to them also. So it's se sipakli, or one crocodile, ome, ehekat, two wind, eyi, uh, kali, three house, um, now we, uh, Quetzpali, Quetzpali is a lizard, um, and then uh, Makwili, uh, Koat. So this is how you count. So you're going to count um, one crocodile, two wind, three house, four lizard, five snakes, six death, seven uh, uh, deer, eight rabbit, and you count all the way through. When you get up to the top over here, that's Akat, 
which is read. When you get up to that, you get to the number 13. So now you're going to start the numbers all over again. You're not done with all the days because there are 20 days. So you're going to start the numbers. No. So this is how the counting was done. This is the basic calendar. There are actually three calendars, Mesoamerican calendars. It's the same calendar that's used by the Mayans. It's, it's, it was used throughout Mesoamerica. Same calendar that was used by the Mixtec. Um, the, the concept is the same. The dates are mostly given the same names. Um, and, and the idea of using 13 and 20 are, are consistent all the way through. Um, now, people may interpret these differently. It's like the um, astrology. People say, oh, well, I'm a Capricorn. I was born on a Capricorn and maybe under this particular moon or that star or, or, or this planet or whatever. The information and how people interpret it will change, but the numbers re remain, remain the same. So this is sort of an astrological, but it's not so much astrological as it is related to um, uh, the cycle of the, of the women. Uh, the last trecena is this one, which is Sekoat. And um, this is the, the, oh, this is the ninth Resena. Um, so, so this gives you an idea. But embedded with these also are all these drawings. Now, these, this is from Codex Borgia. Codex is, there, there's, there's a group of, of codices co, um, that are, uh, that still remain, that were not burned in the book burnings. And what we find is there's some similarity to these, similarity to these because they're, these, they, they have aspects of them that are about the calendar. And so this is the calendar here. And embedded within each trecena is all this information. So embedded within this one, um, we see uh, two deities. There's usually two deities and some other things about it. And when you learn to read these and you learn to understand what they say. And this is, again, once again, like astrology. It says that if you're born under this particular trecena within these 13 days, these are attributes that you'll have as a human. Uh, there we go. So here's, uh, here's a way of counting all the trecena. So when, what you are looking at in front of you right now is the full 260-day calendar. It doesn't look anything like our calendar, right? Our yearly calendar that we use, our, Christ, our Christian calendar. Um, they call it Gregorian or they call it, um, they call it other things, but it's, it's a Christian calendar because it's rooted in the idea of counting from the time of Christ's birth. Let me say something about calendars. Calendars are arbitrary. You know, people say, oh, today's a special day. It's 10, 10, 20, 20. That's arbitrary. They're just numbers. We just get, assign those numbers to days. All, it, all the calendars are ways of keeping track of something. They're ways of counting. There's nothing particular about them except that we attribute things to them. Um, but if you look on the bottom right-hand side, and that's usually how you read the codices. You started on the right and read to the left. Uh, on the bottom right-hand side is Sesipakli. So Sesipakli, it's one Sipakli, and then you're going to count through the rest of the 12 dots to get through the 13 days. Right, so Sesi Pakli, and we had counted through them on the first Tresena, you get all the way to the end and you finish 13, which is 13 Akat, and then you get all the way to the far left and you have a little symbol there, which is Ocelot, which is a Jaguar. So now we're gonna start with the count of one again and say one Jaguar, and then we're gonna count all the way across to the right and then we go up and we have Masat. So we're gonna start one Masat, and then we're going to count 13 days all the way across till we get to Xochitl, which is the flower there on the left. And so what happens is as we're counting these, we're moving through the trecenas until we get through all 260 days. Okay. I realize this is a lot of information for you, but you're probably not going to get this information anyplace else. And this helps us. It, it, it is a foundation for understanding a day that we're celebrating because this is what it's rooted in. And as you can see in the, in the imagery in this, on the right-hand side is, is uh, sometimes they say Quetzalcoatl, and the way you know it is because of the beard. Um, but this is Quetzalcoatl on the right. It's also Ehecatl because of the beak, the beak and the pointed hat. And then also if you look on the chest, this is the guy that's in black on the right. If you look on the chest, there's a symbol there right there that has sort of five things pointing out like a hand. That's a slice through a conch shell. And the conch shell is related to wind you blow wind through the conch shell and you make sound or you bring it alive you bring you you give you animate it and it's the idea of animation because uh, indigenous people have always believed that the whole universe is animated everything is animated and sometimes we can uh, be the catalyst to animate something so a is the wind and it wind is one of the four animators that give us as humans life that animate us 
And so that's it. On the left side is uh, 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 Miklan Siwat because she's wearing a scarf. He's wearing the uh, breech cloth and she is wearing, I'm sorry, the skirt. She's wearing the skirt. So this is Miklan Siwat, Siwat meaning woman. But, but understand that within the, the, the Mesoamerican cosmology, that the gods are neither masculine nor feminine, that they are both. So when we say Quetzalcoatl, you can, you can interpret that as, being, as a male being, as a masculine being, but it's neither masculine nor feminine. It's just the attributes that are uh, assigned to it. And on the, so when we say Miklansiwat, we're saying the feminine aspect of death, but there's also Miklanteltli, which is the Lord of Death, um, but, but it's the same, Lord of Death, uh, Lady of Death, they're, they're still both the entity of death. But death and life and death are two parts to an understanding. We call it uh, inamia. And, and inamia is, is this, this uh, relationship that you have of two sometimes uh, opposing elements. So when we think of light and shadows, you can't have shadows without light. So light and shadows are two of the same thing. They're not separate from each other. So they're not, they're not really contrasting. So life and death are two parts of one thing, and that one thing is animation or existence. They're two parts of existence. The opposite of existence isn't death, it's extinction. So we have existence and extinction. Those are the ideas embedded in the base and the philosophy of, of this Mesoamerican Nahua uh, cosmology. So here we have our two aspects of existence, which are life and death. And when something dies, we bury it in the ground, it nourishes the ground, and out of that comes new life. So they, they work together. You can't have life without death or death without life. Okay, so that's embedded in this whole notion and this whole concept. And of course, once again, who are the creators? They're women. Women are the ones that bring life into this world. They're the creators. And so here we have this whole idea of creation. Uh, I'll, let me add one more component to that. For the Aztec, at least, um, there was the idea, the people of the Triple Alliance there in Tenochtitlan, um, the um, idea that the most revered place to go when you died, because there were four places you could go, but the most revered place to go was to go be with the sun, Huitzilopochtli. And what happens is the men, only the warriors could go there. If you died in battle or if you were sacrificed as a result of being captured and then sacrificed uh, in battle, you're, you're, you're captured in battle and then sacrificed, that then you got to go be with the sun and you bring the sun up every single day. So you bring it up to the zenith. And then from the zenith, the women are the ones that put the sun to bed. So the women are also warriors. And the objective of war for the Aztec people wasn't to go kill. That's, it's easy to kill. It was more difficult to capture someone. And when you captured them, you brought them back. You called him son. He called you father. You brought him back. And he knew he was going to die, that he would be sacrificed. Um, but he'd be sacrificed for, for a reason. And he would be the messenger that would carry the prayers up to Huitzilopochtli, to the sun. And, but the women also captured, capped, had captives. Women would give birth, and when they gave birth, now they had a captive. They, they brought into this world their prisoner, and their prisoner was their child. But sometimes, sometimes the women didn't survive giving birth. And because they didn't survive giving birth, then they were considered warriors who had died in battle. And the battle was trying to bring a captive into this world. And so they got to put the sun to rest. So that, that's one of the places. If you died of, um, if you died uh, of drowning, if you had some kind of disease that that flooded your lungs, like pneumonia, um, if you had gout or pleurisy or one of these other things that that took your life, then you would go to another place called Tlalolcan, and that's where you would go. If you were an infant and you died died before the age of reason, whatever they decide reason is, if you died before the age of reason, then you would go back to this special place where there was a tree that. Um, would give this milk, uh, this, this milk with honey in it, and it would feed the souls of these infants that had died, and then they would be able to be reborn and brought back into this world. Um, and, then, uh, and then there's Mictlan. Everybody else goes to Mictlan. 
what determined where you go, where, where you go after you die, was dependent upon how you died. So you could be a horrible person all your life, but if you died in battle, you got to go be with Huitzilopochtli. And if you were of no major significance, then you went to Mictlan. And this wasn't judgment, this is just where you went, it's just how you died and where you went, right? So these are some of the things and some of the stories that they would, they would tell us and share with us, which is a whole different idea. It's not about how you are as a person. Now, if you're gonna be a good person, be a good person because you choose to be a good person, not because uh, you're, you, you, you're, you think you're, you're being promised something in an afterlife. That's a, that's a foreign concept to us. Um, so here are the days. This is a calendar you're familiar with, which people call the Aztec calendar. It's actually the uh, Tornal Machiot, um, the sundial, if you will. And if you start up at the very top and you move left, the first symbol is uh, an elaborate symbol for um, Sipakli, which is the crocodile. And then you go left to the next one, and it's, um, which also looks like a crocodile, which is uh, Ehekat. And then you go down to the next one, which is Kali, which is house, and then lizard. So you go all the way around. Well, if you're counting around these and you're counting them and you're using the numbers, one Sipakli, uh, two wind, three house, four lizard, five snake, and you get all the way around, you're going to get down to Akat, which is down on the bottom right, and Akat is reed, and then you're going to get to Ocelot, which is the jaguar, and you're going to start the number again, one, two, three, four, all the way to you get around um, 13, and it's going to take you uh, 20 cycles to get around this to get back to one Sipakli again, to one crocodile again, 13 cycles or 260 days. So that's how this worked. Um, ingenious, absolutely ingenious. Uh, someone, one of our teachers, um, Mictlan Ejecateo um, Cuautlincha, uh, said to us that the uh, Aztec calendar was a compact disc that embedded in it was so much information. And I'm not gonna go into that, but in, in the middle of these, um, these days, is all the information about the previous worlds that existed before this fifth world that we're in now, which is the world of Donati, um, the world of humans. Here, once again, uh, the days, um, uh, starting, uh, where is it, Sipakli on the upper left. Now, this one has been changed so that we can read it the way we're used to reading, right? Left to right and then down the page. Um, but that, that's how these numbers are. Well, what I want to do for you now is there's a point at which what they wanted to do was start keeping track of days in accordance to a yearly calendar, in accordance to the movement of the earth around the sun. Now, they don't translate it as that. We understand that a year is a, is a movement of the earth around the sun. But they knew that there were cycles and that this particular cycle, they wanted to be able to keep track of it because the 260 day gestational cycle doesn't match up to a yearly cycle. So they came up with a different calendar. But in order to do that, they had to add to it 105 days because it was off. It was only 260 days. They needed to add another 105 to it. So the way they did that is they said, well, if we create 18 months of 20 days, then we'll come up with 360. That's going to leave us five days left over, which they call Nemontemi. Now, you can think of Nemontemi, people call them the dead days, but the better way to think about Nemontemi is Nemontemi is like vacation, right? You get a week off of vacation at the end of the year. That's your Nemontemi. Right, you, you don't, you're not gonna do anything on those days. You don't have to work, you don't have to be any place. You're just gonna rest for five days. That's what Nemontemi is. Um, and so that's how these calendars worked. Now in Tenochtitla, if you stood upon um, a particular uh, pyramid that was built to Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl, and you looked east, you would see in front of you Templo Mayor. And above on the top on Templo Mayor are two um, altars, if you will. They're, they're, they're calis, they're little houses on top of the huge pyramid. The one on the left is to Tlaloc, and the one on the right is to Huitzilopochtli. But if you stood on that pyramid on certain days of the year for the solstices and for the equinoxes, then what you could actually do is reset the calendar. Because as you know, um, we use leap year every four years to reset the calendar because it, it, our calendar, the Christian calendar is not precise. 
And it's because the movement around the sun is not precise. And over time, it changes. Before time and after time, the way we count it, it's moved differently. But what they could do is reset the calendars just by looking from that one premier pyramid of Quetzalcoatl to the east, to Templo Mayor, and they say, oh, we need to start the calendar today. Today starts the new, the new count for the year. And so they had a way of doing that, and they could do that either four years or, or there were other ways that they could, they could set, reset the calendar. So this is now the yearly calendar, and this one's called Shi Powali. Shi means year, and Powali means count. Okay. Um, so this is Shi Powali. But they also have said, so how are we going to keep track of the years? So they gave four names to the years. There are only four year names. One, and we start um, with Akat, which is up on the left here. And this, and the way this is, is shown, it's shown so that you can see it and, and understand it. But as you can see, it's on the bottom right of the, of the full circle. But we start with Akatl. But we're going to use the same type of counting. We're going to count to 13. And then we're going to start the count all over again, even though we're still counting through 20 images, right? Or, or, or these four images in this case, we're only going to count four images. So you're going to start one akat, and then you drop down. It's two uh, tekpat, which is knife. And then you drop across to the bottom right, and it's three kali, which is house. And you come up to four tochli. And then you come back left, and you start with akat again. But now it's five akat. And in order for you to get back to one akat, it takes 52 years, right? It's, or it's four times 13 cycles. So we have these four numbers. We're going to do 13 cycles, and it's going to give you a total of 52 years. So it takes 13 cycles to get back to one akat. Does that make sense? This is one of the images that was drawn by one of the priests uh, that came here. Uh, we find this in Sahagun's book. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry, in uh, Diego Duran's book. So this picture that's in the middle that looks like a medicine wheel, it's a way of counting. You start from the very center, and if you look in the center and you go up, you'll see Akat, and then you drop to the left, and it's two Tekpatl, and you drop underneath that, and you'll see Kali, and then you come up, and it's four, and then you come back up to the top, and then it's five, or Makwili, five uh, Akat again. And you do the cycles till you've gone through all the numbers, and you start over again. In the meanwhile, 52 years have passed. So this is the year calendar. And, and I'm explaining this because they're two separate calendars. They count different things, but, we're, but they're based in the same uh, numerology. Um, so here's what that would look like. If you were to do a chart of the year uh, using this Mesoamerican count um, of 18 months on the left and 20 days on the top, this is what you'd come up with. So you're going to count 20 days across the top, and then you go to the next month and then the next month. But I want to point your attention to two particular months that are here that I've highlighted in red. And here they're called Tequi, uh, Tequiltontli and Wei tequi, 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 uh, It's a little bit of a challenge to say those. However, know that these two particular months are also pronounced differently. You'll see them here. It's all, they're also called Mikail Witontli and way Mikhail week. Okay, so um, these are two of the months, and they're the two months that I want to give, uh, that I want to draw your attention to. So in accordance to this particular calendar, there were two out of the 18 months that were assigned to the spirits that had passed, the people that had crossed over. The first month was dedicated to the children, and the second month was dedicated to the adults. Okay, so it's two months. We spend a month of celebrations uh, remembering the children that have died before their time, and then we take a, a, another month and celebrate the adults that have passed on. So those are the two months, no? Um, if you look on, there's a, something called, um, if you just Google Aztec calendar, you're going to come up with this particular calendar. It's called the Aztec and Mayan calendar. And it's Aztec and Mayan because they're exactly the same. They're, they're using the same numerology. Now, this particular calendar that you see here, it has, uh, it's using both calendars. The first two dates that are called Tonali, which is date, um, and Tresena, which is a 13-day period, those two dates are part of the first one, the count of days, the first calendar. The second one that you see on the right 
is the Shipuwali, which is the year count, but all it's naming for you is the year. So this year is nine house. We're in the year nine house. We say we're in 2020. Well, actually we're in the year nine house by this calendar. But on the day on November 1st, it's going to be the day three grass in the trecena of one dog, okay? You put these together and they give you information. If you're born on that day, then there's all this information that we can cull from that, that we can take out of that. But this then gives you um, three, two, two of the calendars. But what happens is if you're looking at every 52 years and you're trying to separate one group of 52 years from the second group of 52 years, you start to get confused, right? Because they have the same names. So then they started doing the, the, the Yankuiktlet, which is the new fire ceremony. And then they started doing different, uh, keeping tracks of the new fire ceremonies, the Aztecs did of the new fire ceremonies. And in the new fire ceremonies, then they knew by which new fire they were. It's the fifth new fire. Okay, so it's the fifth 52 year count. Um, and that's how they were able to keep track of the longer count. And that longer count um, also helps us, at least with the Mayan calendar and how we do, it, it helps us understand the third calendar, which is a um, 5,000 year calendar, right? So, but I won't get into that. That starts to get confusing. But I want you to understand this because this is where we're pulling from when we say, well, what is Dia de los Muertos? Well, it actually comes from two particular uh, months in the Aztec calendar that were dedicated to people that had passed. And then the Christians arrived. Our, our people as indigenous people have been very adaptive and, and, and they were able to do whatever they needed to do uh, to accommodate all the changes that they experienced as a consequence of, of the people coming in from uh, the Iberian Peninsula. And their impositions are religious impositions. So there's no, so what they would do is they'd look at the calendar and, and, and they'd try to drop indigenous ideas and concepts into the Christian calendar. And, and, and I'll tell this through a story. Um, if you go to um, Tepeshitla, which is in the Huasteca, which is in Northern Veracruz. If you go to Tepeshitla, they have a particular day set aside for San Juan. And this day happens, it, it's actually right around the summer solstice. It's around the 21st of June. And so, there's a whole day that they do that. And what they do is they take San Juan and they, they take the, the saint out and they parade him around town and they do a whole celebration. It's, it's a whole big deal that they have. But what they're really doing is they're praying to Tlaloc. Tlaloc is the deity of rain, right? So what they did is they took all the uh, aspects or characteristics of Tlaloc and embedded them on a... Uh, a saint that happened to have the same date or the same time frame. So when do you want to pray for rain? Well, the summer solstice is a good time to pray for rain. And this is the saint that celebrated on the summer solstice. So we're going to declare San Juan the saint that we celebrate. So this is accommodation. This is how our, our communities have been very um, uh, inventive and creative in terms of how they do this. So what happens is they look at this calendar and there's no time set aside for uh, honoring our dead, for our relationship with those people that were part of our lives that are no longer with us. And so what they did is they assigned it to one day, initially one day on the uh, Christian calendar, which is All Saints Day, which is November 1st. Uh, however, it was two calendar months and so what they have to do is they have to assign a second day to it. So Dia de, lo, Dia de los Muertos is not Dia, it's Dias de los Muertos, which are November 1st and November 2nd. The first day is assigned to the children, all the children that have died. And the second day is assigned to the adults that have passed. Um, some more poetry here, but I, I want to go into some storytelling. I'm intoxicated, I weep, I grieve, I think, I speak. Within myself, I discover this. Indeed, I shall never die. Indeed, I shall never disappear. So in a, way, in a sense, it's this idea that perhaps we go to someplace else and there, there's truly where we live. There where there is no death. There where death is overcome. Let me go there. Indeed, I shall never disappear. 
so it's this idea that maybe the, what our time here on earth is is temporary but there's someplace else we can go when 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 we uh when we pass from this world this is a mercado in mexico in the f during the time uh during around this time when people are going there and they sell a whole lot of flowers but especially sempol uh sempol sochi are the marigolds they sell the really big ones over there so on the bottom uh photo uh if you look on the left the red flowers those are the red sempol sochi in the middle of it are the orange sempol sochi sempol sochi means sempoali is a full count sochi is flower sempol sochi means uh 20 plus petals. In other words, there's so many petals on this thing. If you were to count them, you would never, you never run out and there, you never uh, complete your count. Simple al So that's, so, so, so it has some meaning to it. But these are the flowers that are also used because a person's life has finished. They've counted all their years here and now they've gone on to the afterworld. The Sempal Sochi has a very strong smell, so it invites the spirits to come back. So that they call it Flor de Muerto in Mexico also. But it's the, 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 the flower that's used in the altares to invite the spirits back to let them know it's time. We've set up the altar for you. Come. We set up things. We, you see us here also buying uh, papel picada. This was a group of us that went down in our studies with Elena Avila. We're there. Uh, Xochit, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Elo Xochit is there. She guided us through this ceremony that we were part of. Um, and we went down there, we went to the Mercado, we purchased all these flowers, spent lots of money uh, buying the flowers to set up these altares. And, and I want to talk about this because um, there's a way in which uh, Dia de los Muertos is recognized and celebrated and has always been celebrated in Mexico and how it's arrived eventually to the United States, uh, brought up by um, Chicano, Mexicano people that, that, that are here that are looking for ancestral roots of some sort. This is the altar that we did. Now, this is not the altar that you're used to looking at. This is an altar that comes from the tradition of Tezcatlipoca, which is in the north. And if you look at this altar, I'm going to explain a few things on this altar that we see that sits on the ground. It's a very big altar. We spent a whole day just setting this up and starting to, to build this. And then we watched this altar for four days. So on this altar, you can see... Um, the four corners in the center, and on all of those resides what we call is a poposhkomit, which is a, a place where we burn the copal, the incense. We have to keep these fires burning nonstop during this whole, these whole four days. So we watched this, this altar for four days. Our ceremony ran for these four days. Um, but the very top that's white there, that's the east. So we know that that direction is east. Across from it, it's red. And so the east is a place of men. It's a place of Quetzalcoatl, Ehecatl, uh, of the wind. The, the red is a place of women, because if you remember, the, the, the men take that sun and bring it up to the zenith, and then from there the women put the sun to bed and it goes to sleep uh, for the night. And so red represents the place of women. It's, all, it's, it's a place also of Kamashli or Shipetotec. Um, and different people will say these differently, but, but usually the color red is associated with that. Sometimes they swap these two colors in, in some traditions. But that's what this represents, and this is a place of women. If you go to the right, that's usually blue. It almost looks black here, but that's blue. And blue is a place of youth, the place of the children, the place of joy, of happiness, uh, of innocence, of the will. Um, and so we, we want to recognize that. And then from youth, we move across into the place of elders, the place of the, of the weweas, of the old people, um, the kolwaka. And so it's black. And black is a color that represents also Mictlan. So in the east, we have Tlawistlampa, uh, the place where the light comes out. In the west, we have Siwatlampa, the place of women. In the right, we have Huitztlampa, the place of thorns. Um, and then in the uh, north, Miktlampa, which is a place of, of the departed. And then you can see this extra layer of uh, flowers that are present there on the upper left-hand side there in the area of Miktlan, because those are the flowers to invite the spirits from Miktlan to come and to be with us, because we've set up an altar for them filled with food. Within this altar here, are a whole lot of fruit and food and chocolate and all kinds of stuff we set up for them, for them to come and eat. The idea is that they come from Iktlan 
the, 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 the gates open to Mictlan around uh, Dia de los Muertos. The, the dead come here and they come looking for what we've set out for them. If we set out all kinds of food, then they get to take that back with them. They take it back spiritually, if you will, but they get to go back to their home in Mictlan and they can share everything that we've given to them. But sometimes we don't put, do anything for them and they go back all, all poor and with nothing to offer. And so the idea is that we want to set up something so that when they come, they can go back with an abundance of the things that they enjoyed here on earth. And when they go back, they can share that with the other people that are there in Mictlan. So that's what we do. So that's what we did. And we watched this uh, particular uh, altar uh, for several days. Uh, here we are once again um, on the left, one of the uh, apprentices. She's uh, taking care of the fuego, fueguito there in the, in the Popochcomit keeping it going and, and putting copal in there. And you can see all the fruit that are there. She's in the place uh, to the left is her place, the place of the women. Um, and, and another one here, uh, we had to keep a fire going and, and, and in that, um, um, in that uh, kashi, in that pot there, um, there's some chocolate going in there, chocolate or coffee or whatever we have going so people can drink. And we watch this fire for several days. And while we do this, the community comes and celebrates with us. And we had um, theater, we had music, we had um, people reciting poetry, we had danza, we had all these things going on during the course of these four days. Even amidst the rain or whatever the weather was, we're outside and we just stay there. We watch this altar because we're watching for our relatives coming back and taking care of them and, and celebrating um, their arrival. So that's what went on here during these, uh, during these four days. It was really, really, really a beautiful time and beautiful ceremony uh, to be able to do this. It's a lot of work. We did put a lot of work into this. And this is the altar where we set up some of our, our pictures and some of the food uh, on the table in the pan de muerto and some more flowers so that the, uh, the muertos, when they came, they would know where to go and to find it. So this is one of the ways in Mexico that uh, Dia de los Muertos is celebrated. This is a community altar rather than the personal altar. What happens is uh, one of the first times when I went to an event for Dia de los Muertos, it was in 1979, and I was uh, studying there in uh, Veracruz. And we went to a place called Naulinco, a small little community way up in the mountains. And we get there, and what happens is we got there, and in the evenings, um, the people would go, if someone died, if, some, if, a, if a family lost a family member, they would put a black ribbon over their doorway. And you knew walking around town that they had someone that died and that with that black ribbon over their doorway, that they had an altar set up inside. So you, you arrive at their door, they invite you in, they give you tamales and they give you um, aguardiente. And they, they, you go in front of their altar and you sing alabanzas, you sing, sing songs and, and then uh, to celebrate that. And then they share the food with you and then you go to the next house. So you go all throughout the town doing this and celebrating it. And then afterwards, uh, uh, after you do these on the nights of, of, the days, of the days after Dia de los Muertos, you go back and what they do is they take all that food off the altar and they share it with the community. So this is... Um, this is what we did. So you could go back the next day and eat all kinds of food and tamales and fruit and whatever they had on their altares. And that's part of the process. Now on the last day, on, on November 2nd, what we did when we, we did our, our, our work down there is we went to the Panteon, we went to Campo Santo, to the cemetery, and we went to the different grave sites there and we put flowers all over them and we decorated them as a way for people to see them and, and, to, and for the departed to know that they weren't forgotten. And it was depressing to see some of the, some of the grave sites there that no one had taken care of. So we'd take some flowers over there and put them and, and take care of the grave sites. So this is how it looks kind of when you set up some of the, the grave sites for Dia de los Muertos on the evening that you go and do this. And then um, the community that we were with, what they did is they prayed a rosario afterwards and after we took care of the, alta, uh, the altares and the, and the grave sites. And they, they, they did the rosary. And then after we did the rosary, then we went back home. And then the next day, um, what we did is we went to the altar and we collected all the food and we took it to a little escuelita that was across the street. And we shared all that food with all these little kids. So you can see how happy these kids are, or maybe they're fighting, I don't know. But all these kids are, are happy because we shared the food with them, uh, all the fruit and all the pan, pan dulce and all the other stuff. And so um, that's what you do with these ceremonies. 
So that's uh, one of the ways in which they're celebrated down there. Now, in 1985, in the 1980s, uh, at least in my experience and the experience of some of the people here uh, across uh, the Southwest, we started losing a lot of our loved ones to AIDS. They were just dying from AIDS. A lot of gay men were dying from that. And we wanted to be able to honor them and to do something for that. And so a lot of the people here started doing, um, because these were people, that, a lot of people that were dying. There were millions of people that died. Um, and because they died, we wanted to honor them in some way. So we, what we did is we started setting up altares. That's what else can you do, right? There was, we had no other recourse. It's like what we're dealing with now with COVID. Um, and so we started setting up altares. So this is a picture of me in front of an altar that I've set up for some of the people that I've lost and, and my father who also passed. And so this is what we're doing. So some of the people, Chicanos, Mexicanos, people that are connected with the danza, danza Mexica, danza Azteca, uh, what they started doing at some point was setting up altares and then it just sort of, you know, it was like a spark that started this, this larger fire and people started doing this um, more and more all over the place. So you start to see these altares at home, sometimes set up in different layers. And there are elements that we put on them, obviously the flores. We don't have as many simple alsochi here, so we use other flores on there sometimes. Um, and, and all the other things, and putting the kinds of foods and, and sometimes uh, drinks and, and cigarettes or whatever else that a person liked when they were here in life. We share them so when they come back, they have them to, to, to partake of again. Um, this is a picture of um, some panels that were made during the AIDS crisis when a lot of people are dying. And, and I, like I'm saying, thousands and thousands of people died. Uh, they started dying, a lot of them in 1985, and they died for the course of the next 10 years. And so what people started doing, not knowing what else to do, they started making these panels that are the size of a coffin. And they started sewing these panels together. And then they would display them. And this is uh, one of the last times that it was displayed in Washington, DC. The panel was so big because so many people had died. There's just this huge, huge presentation of it, right? But it's this idea that um, we want to, people in different ways want to honor their dead. And for our community, for the Spanish speaking community and indigenous community, we, 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 we reached back and we brought forward and up from Mexico. Um, Dia de los Muertos is a way of celebrating. And so that's what it means to us. It has, it's a relationship with our loved ones who are no longer with us. And it's a relationship to our ancestral past, right? Um, and so that's, that's what we're doing here. Um, we were asked to do an altar also in, uh, in Boulder at the Museo here at the University of Colorado. Uh, it's a, a museum of anthropology. And so here, we, we, here we've done it. Now, we don't have San Paul Sochi, so we used grains. So what you see here are a whole lot of beans and maybe some lentejas and, and, and different things that we use for the same color and for the same idea. So we set up this altar on the floor uh, in addition to the other altar behind it. Now, because this was in the museum, we weren't able to light the candles and and burn the copal and all that kind of stuff because they're afraid we're going to burn the place down. But at the very least, we were able to set up an altar here, uh, and they allowed us to do that uh, for a couple of years, which was uh, which was good. So it's only been really in the last 15 to 20 years that Dia los Muertos has really kicked off here in the United States because people have started. Uh, it's sort of become a a thing to do. Uh, unfortunately, we don't want it to be commercialized, but I suppose that it will be. There, there's some teachings that come from Quetzalcoatl, not the, te not, not the God, but Quetzalcoatl, the man that walked the earth who was a Toltec. And he said, there's only one universe and it's called Omeyocan. And it doesn't demand anything of us but serpents and butterflies. So the idea that when we're making sacrifices, the one sacrifice that we will make at the end of our life is our, is our, our own life. We will give serpents our body and butterflies our spirit we will offer those back to the earth, to our mother earth, and to back to the, uh, to the deities, to the powers that be. And that's all that we need to do. Beyond that, our sacrifices don't need to be anything more. We don't need to take anyone else's life. And, and he also said that there are only three things that belong to man, but only two are totally pleasing, love and pain. With love, everything is united. Um, with pain, everything is separated. But that's the rhythm of the universe, right? This love and this pain, this unity and this separation. With one, with love, it's bought. With the other, it's paid, right? 
And this is how the balance of justice uh, re uh, remains in the universe. And then he says that the third thing that belongs to man is knowledge, but that fosters arrogance. And so we think because we know something, we become arrogant. So, Is it true no one really lives on earth? Not forever on earth, only a little while here. Though it be jade, it falls apart. Though it be gold, it wears away. Though it be quetzal plumage, it is torn asunder. Not forever on earth, only a little while here. This particular poem is attributed to Nezalvalcoyot, who was one of the leaders of the Triple Alliance uh, of the Akolwa on the east coast of uh, Lake Texcoco at the time. Uh, there are a lot of poems that are attributed to him, and this is one of them. Um, and so it's this idea that we're only here for a little while, but we make an impact while we're here. As we walk through here, we're counted in the books, in the codices, we're counted in the books uh, of, of time, and we carry time for a brief uh, moment, and then we pass on into the next world, but we've left something behind. So those that are left behind, those that are still alive, want to remember that, want to honor that. And that's our relationship with those uh, that have parted. Um, so that's that's what we're doing with this. So muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to be able to talk about this. We're going to open up now, I think, into um, some questions. Um, so we'll do that. I, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation to, to begin to open up a little bit about, about who we are and what our connection is and what Dia de los Muertos is more than just this idea of a you know, Halloween. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Thank you. I, uh, you're right that this isn't something that we often learn. And this was something that in some of the comments that were coming through, people also uh, acknowledged just how unique this opportunity was for us this evening, was to be presented this deep ancient knowledge to, to reconnect uh, with where we come from uh, and to celebrate some of our loved ones. Um, so thank you. Uh, and I'm gonna ask David, if you can keep that last slide up so that people know the upcoming program that will be involved. And I'll also go ahead and post it in the, uh, in the chat feature. Uh, but I wanna read one of the comments that came through to me privately. It said, I think as a person of European descent, we are expected to mourn quickly, move on, and not discuss the loved ones that we've lost. So I think at least in part, the embracing of the de los Muertos is a day to remember and connect with those that are no longer here. Uh, and you're right, that's something that's really impactful, that the way that we think about healing and mourning here, it's linear. Something happens and it's done. You move on and you continue forward. But this, these traditions give us something more rich and complex with much more depth for us to, to draw upon. And for that, I'm really grateful. Uh, and there's a lot of questions that are coming through here in the chat feature. Uh, is there a book that you recommend for poems and stories like those you shared today, translated in English or Spanish from Nahuatl? Uh, you know, um, I, I'm going to recommend one of the books uh, by Porfilio Diaz. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, Leon Portilla. Miguel Leon Portilla has a book of poems that's called uh, 15 Poets of the Aztec World. That, that's the easiest one that you're gonna find. He prints some of the stuff in Nahuatl and then he translates it. Uh, this book has been translated into English. You can also get the book, uh, 15 Poetas de, del, del Mundo Azteca o el Mundo Nahuatl. Um, but you can get these books in Spanish or English, but that's a good place to start to look at some of this stuff. There's a lot of information out there. It's scattered all over the place, but I think, um, Miguel Leon Portilla, his book is a good place to start if you're wanting to look for some of this information. And, that, and it, it's a small book, it's pretty cheap, it's not that expensive, you can find it any place, so, yeah. Great. Thank you, let's see another question that is a really important one, um, asked by Rito Ramirez, uh, can you tell us the meaning behind the different layers to the altar and what they represent? Um, 
Well, it's, uh, this is, there's a long answer to that, but I'm going to give you a short one. So each layer, you can do up to 13 levels on the, on, on, on the altares. But no one, unless you're a curandero, unless you're a maestro, unless you've been doing this stuff and you understand this stuff, you wouldn't have 13 layers, no? Um, and so it's okay just to set up one or two or three layers, right? Um, when in the Aztec cosmology, they viewed the world as that which was above us, the cosmos which are above us, that which is below us, which is Mictlan, and that which is upon the earth. So that's three altares. But the body was divided in the same way. Everything above the belly button is that which is above. Everything below the belly button is Mictlan, that which is below. And there's a, that which is at the level of the belly button, right? And so the, the cosmology of, of, the, of the Mexica, of the Aztec people, was sort of that kind of cosmology, a way of seeing the world where everything is part of a larger circle everything is animated but there are three levels to it three primary levels so if you do altares and you do three levels that's plenty most people will just do one level and that's just fine um, but it would, it would it would take years of study and apprenticeship to arrive at the place where you're using all, all 13 levels huh? mm. does that help yeah and I think that's important to, to really stress for everyone that's here is that this is just the beginning uh, what I would really love is that today's conversation sparked that interest uh, that encourages you to pursue your own research uh, from hereafter. Um, because this is, again, just a taste. I'm sure, I mean, you could have gone on for, for days going through all of this. So I hope that- That's why, why I wrote a book. <laughs> it's in the book. If you, if you read English and you, and you buy the book, A Magic Feather, it has a lot of this information embedded in it in terms about understanding the cosmology and how we incorporate that in healing. The book is about curanderismo. It's about healing. But what does that mean, right? What is healing? And, and if it's a Western idea, it's take a pill and you get better. But that's not an indigenous concept of healing. So, yeah. Hmm. So thank you for that. One of the questions to... Uh, let's see. I want to fit in as many questions as I can within the next 10 minutes. Um, is there a book for children that you recommend specifically for a three-year-old uh, that they could start with the ultra tradition now? Uh, and actually, we have some of them here at Hijos del Sol if you want to come by. Uh, but if there's others that you know of, David, uh, which do you recommend? I, you know, I don't. When, when it comes to children's books, I don't. So I, I, I defer them to you. If you have some books, some information that you're selling, that's great. I, I'm glad that it's out there. Yep. And one of those books specifically. So here on the slide that you see, you see the two different altar kits that we're presenting. Uh, the top one is the adult kit, but the bottom one here uh, is specifically for children. And it includes a book called I Remember Abuelito uh, that talks about... Um, Dia de los Muertos, uh, in a way that's accessible to children. Uh, so if you're interested, please reach out to us, uh, and that's included in the, the children's kit as well. Uh, let's see, another question that came through early on in the presentation. Uh, don't scholars also believe that since the Toltecs, uh, they were stargazing, that also informed their lives and cosmovisions? If that wasn't central to the calendar, did it form other parts of the lives of the Aztecs? Thanks. So, so yes, um, I, I didn't get into that because we start to get into some things that are far too complex for people. And some of the calendars, in particular, some of the Mayan calendars and two of them that are left over, when we look at, or the, or the codices that they have, they give us very specific information about the movements of Venus, the movements uh, of the other planets, the movements of the sun. Um, there was a lot, we were able to use, using the numbers of 13 and 20 as ways of counting, we were able to, to correlate all kinds of information. So yes, the, that information is embedded in these, but, but that, again, that's, that's more study and, and more than I could present on just this. So you, the, the, the question, the person that's asking the question, absolutely, scholars know that there's much more embedded into these calendars than just, uh, than just a gestational count, yeah. Great. Uh, let's see some other questions that came through. Um, are there any connections that you see between the Dia de los Muertos celebrations? Well, now Dias, multiple days, um, and beliefs or practices of indigenous peoples from the United States. Thanks a lot. So, so I'll give you one example and I'll keep it short. 
sometimes we're not ready to let go of someone that has left us, right? Because we really, really loved our, our, our sibling or our friend or, or, or a relative. And so what the Lakota people do, the Sioux people do, um, they have something that's called um, uh, keeping of the spirit. And you do this for a year. So you keep some element. Maybe you cut the person's hair. And, and this is also an indigenous thing. Um, you keep the person's hair and you put it on the altar. So what you're going to do for the next year is you're going to feed that person because by keeping their hair, you keep them on your altar. That means you have to take care of them. That means you're going to make food and every time you cook, you're going to feed them. You're going to feed them. You're going to take care of them. You're going to water them. You're going to talk to them. You're going to do that for a whole year because you're not done saying goodbye yet. But after a year, you have to let go. And now when you let go, then you, there's another ceremony, uh, shedding of the tears, I think it's called wiping of the tears, wiping of the tears. And in the wiping of the tears, then what you do is you, get, you do this huge giveaway. You, 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 over the course of the year, you save money and you buy all this stuff. You invite people to a celebration and you give away all this stuff to them as a way of your, your mourning and your saying goodbye. So there are other ways that uh, different dig indigenous communities um, also hold their ceremonies um, related to their cosmologies. Great. Uh, let's see, any other questions that are coming through? Uh, is there special medicine that is burned on the altars? So what, what we use mostly, what, what is most common is copal, copali, right? People know that, we use that, but you know what? We're, we're, we're bringing something up, and I, I want to say this uh, so that people understand this. When you are, one, honoring your loved ones that have passed, and you're setting up an altar, there's no right or wrong way to do it, right? Know that. That, 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 that however you need to honor your, your, your people that have left you, you go right ahead and honor them, because it's your grief and your sorrow, and this is for you. So don't don't allow other people to impose upon you how to grieve, right? You do what you need to do. There are things that we use, and what, as, it, as the, 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 the celebration moves north into the United States, there are different things that people will introduce. So they'll start using uh, sage, they'll start using cedar, they'll start using other kinds of things that they burn in their smokes, and all of that's, that, all of that's okay, all of that's fine. We don't uh, have as much simple as Sochi up here, so we use other kinds of flowers. All of that's fine. Whatever you do, I just want to say, you know, go ahead and celebrate it. Don't get too crazy, but go ahead and celebrate it in your own way. This is your, this is your grieving. This is, this is your way of saying, this is how I need to honor them. And so, you, you know, you do, you do what you need to do. It's okay. Mm. Thank you for that. And you're right that there's no one way to honor your dead or build an altar. Uh, that'll change from person to person, region to region. Uh, and what the kits that we put together are intended to do is to provide that that base that then is taken home mm -hmm. and customized uh, something special to get you started to create with artists here locally. Uh, the last question that I see here is uh, let's see I just had it um, uh, just uh, here it is how do the barriletes gigantes of Sacate Guatemala relate to the altares? Uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, I don't know. Uh, and I'm just to say that I don't know. I, I, I can't speak to that. So I'm not going to, to make stuff up. Okay. So you would probably want to talk to someone that's more familiar because that's, that's the Mayan territory. I've spent a lot of time uh, around um, Aztec cosmology and, and Nahuatl cosmology and the language but I don't know anything about how they're doing things uh, further south, so I, I, I can't really speak to that. Great. Um, yep. But I do want to say something about people. If, there's, if you're setting up your altares, I want to give you a safety thing that people, no one else is going to tell you. If you're going to do candles, I recommend that you buy the candles in a jar. Make sure that the wick sits in the middle of the candle, because if there's a wick off to the side, it's going to heat the glass, and the glass is going to shatter and break, and it can start a fire. Don't just use plain candles because they can also start a fire. Don't put anything over the flame that can potentially start a fire. And when you take that jar of wax, that, you're, that candle that you're going to put, the vela, the vela that you're going to put, put it into a, jar, a, a bowl of water. So that as it burns, should anything happen, that water is there to put it out. Does that make sense? So that's just a safety thing. No one else is going to tell you that. But you know what? 
be safe. If you don't spend a lot of time around fire and around doing these kinds of things, then there's probably some safety issues that you need to take into account. So whatever you do, be safe. Don't burn down your house, you know, honoring <laughs> your dad. <laughs> yeah, very practical. Thank you for that. All right. Definitely the last question now uh, that came through. Are sugar schools rooted in Mexica practice or are they a new tradition? You know, I've seen the sugar skulls in Mexico, so they're starting to bring them up. Um, the, what they do in Mexico, what, I, what I've seen done is people will go and they put their own name on a sugar skull and then put it in an altar. It's a reminder that you're going to die, right? I know we want to be invincible and live forever, but the fact of the matter is you're on, you're on this earth and in this body for a short period of time. So more than anything, that's what it is. It's just a reminder to you of your time here. Uh, we could we could make it more complicated than that, but in Mexico, it's just it's it's this it's this good relationship with death. It's having a healthy relationship with death, which we should have because we're going to die. Mm. News flash, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, with that, I want to to thank everybody uh, for joining us this evening. I hope that you all learn something from it and that this sparked that creativity within yourself to take your studies further. Weiwei, Tlacatl, Atekpak Young, gracias. I hope that this is the beginning of a long and fruitful partnership. Uh, there were many comments that came through that they can't wait for the next presentation to, to be put together. Um, and everyone that joined us, uh, thank you. I hope that you continue to follow um the programming that we have uh coming for you in the next week uh from how to process historical trauma in an indigenous perspective with Dr. Beltran uh from the graduate school of social work at DU uh we're going to be doing programming around the importance of food and healing and finally we're going to be having a panel with the local OGs that brought Dia de los Muertos to Denver uh, and I want to encourage you all to uh, join us. Uh, and if you are interested in getting your hands on one of those kits, uh, reach out to us at info at lcac-denver.org or call us. And uh, I wanna give a special thanks to our sponsors, uh, US Bank, Visa, Flor South Denver, 8Z Reality, D-Line, uh, Digital, Printing, Gyries, Fabian's Painting, uh, and finally, uh, Nick's Gardening Center. They've all been incredible, and all the things that are included in the altar uh, have been um, created with love and supported from a really big community, which I'm grateful for. And uh, we, will be make sh we will be making sure to share this uh, video uh, to make sure that it reaches as many people as possible in the next couple days. And with that, thank you uh, and good evening. Uh, take care out there and look forward to seeing you all soon.